Morning, Frontline. How are y'all doing today? Good? Thanks for coming today. It's always good to be good uh, in God's house. You know, today's the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. For, for, do we have any first-time visitors with us today, this morning? Welcome, sir. Welcome today. We pray that you have a blessed day today. So, Frontliners, take note. For everybody else, welcome. It's Sunday, the Lord's Day, but for some of us sports fans, it's Super Bowl Sunday, right? <laughs> Super Bowl Sunday, go Cowboys, right? <laughs> Maybe next year. Okay, so that's Lana and New England. Just pray for both of them and whoever wins, okay, whatever. All right, so let's stick to what we know, what I'm going to be here for today, this morning. We all know we're on the winning team anyway. We're on the Lord's team, and the Lord's team is a winning team. And we're all winners in this game called life. Whether it's Super Bowl Sunday or Super Sunday, today is the Lord's Day. So we're going to continue the series that we've been going on through. It's like the fourth week now, and the series is called Questions That Jesus Asks. Jesus asked some awesome and great questions. Some of the previous questions we already covered were, I mean, do you want to get well? When he was asking that paralyzed man. And how about that, the other one is, uh, where's your faith, or why are you afraid? Jesus, he's not in control, even though the boat's shaking and all that storm is raging, he's there. And then last week, Gary talked on, he said, do you believe that I can do this? And this blind man. Awesome questions. And like what Gary said, he mentioned that Jesus asked a question for a reason, and he's probing us. Don't you hate it when you, when you ask somebody a question, and then they say, they answer you with another question, right? That's what Jesus was doing here. Jesus, like in this context, Jesus wasn't looking, you know, he was asking the questions, but he was looking for, he didn't want, he didn't provide the answers. He wanted Peter to provide the answers for him. We can, Jesus can't do it all for us. We've got to do some of it. We've got to meet him. And there's that one movie, we've got to meet him halfway. We need to at least meet Jesus halfway. He can do 99%, but you got to give some effort and provide some answers in this life. So in this context, Jesus, he's the one who wants the answers. And in, what's, and in this question that we're going to talk about this morning, he's asking not a person, but he's asking actually one of the disciples a question. And that question is he's geared towards the main leader of the disciples. We're going to look at the life of Peter today. So... You're probably wondering, or those who are here new uh, believers, you're like, who is, who is Peter? I'm glad you asked. Okay. So Peter, Peter was uh, originally named Simon. Okay. And Jesus changed his name to Peter, which meant the rock. So he was a Galilean. He was a professional fisherman with his brother Andrew. And his brothers came from the village of Bethsaida. So Peter, he was also married, if some of you don't know. And he was also a follower of John the Baptist. And perhaps he was one of the very first disciples that Jesus called. So Peter, he was enthusiastic, he was strong-willed, he was impulsive, he was outspoken, and he was kind of rough around the ed edges. But all for all his strengths, he had his weaknesses too, like all of us. Peter, you know, when they talk about that disease, putting the foot in the mouth disease, I wonder if that came from Peter, because Peter did a lot of that. He would say something and then later regret it. So it was Peter. Wasn't Peter the one who drove uh, the sword and cut the man's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane? It was also Peter who boasted that, you know what, Lord, I'll never leave your side. I'll be with you to the very end. And then later on, wasn't it Peter that denied Jesus? Not once, not twice, but three times. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So that's Peter in a nutshell. So let me set the, the scene or the background for you. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 21. The Gospel of John, it's the, if you were to, it's part of the New Testament. So it's, uh, the New Testament starts off with Matthew, John, John, and John, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. It's the fourth book of the Gospel. So here we see here that Jesus is having breakfast. And we just stop right there, and we can, we'll, read, we'll read that later. But Jesus is having breakfast, and what is the breakfast that Jesus is preparing for the disciples? Fish and bread. So I'm gonna just, I, when I first read that, I was like, 
wait a minute. I know in Hawaii, I'm from Hawaii, McDonald's, we serve spam for breakfast. But fish for breakfast? That's kind of interesting that uh, he would serve. But we know there's a pass to that, you know, the 5,000, it was fish and bread. There was a 4,000 reference, that was fish and bread. So when we die and go to heaven, don't be surprised, right? <laughs> it might be fish and bread up there. So, but saying this, since Jesus was the one who prepared this, being the master iron chef that he is, I'm sure the fish was going to be pretty good, or the meal in general was going to be pretty good. So later, or earlier in, the, in, the, in that chapter, it says, this is actually the third time that Jesus is appearing to his disciples. So we're looking at, they are looking at a resurrected Jesus. In fact, when they were fishing earlier, they didn't recognize him at first. We're talking a resurrected Jesus. They we're talking about Jesus 2.0, right? This is a new Jesus, the new body. He looks different. He's probably clean. He's clean looking. He's probably have a, a certain glow to himself. There's definitely something about the difference of a resurrected Jesus. So now we'll go on to read to our text. And our main text will be coming from John 21, verses 15 to 17. And I, it's, it's in the Living, Trans, uh, Living Bible Translation, because I wanted to get this, this definition or this, this translation and reading. It'll, it'll be a lot easier for you to understand. And it goes like this. After breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than, the, uh, than these others? And yes, Peter replied, you know I am your friend, and feed my lambs, Jesus told him. And then Jesus repeated a question, Simon, son of John, do you really love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I am your friend. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. And once more he asked him, Simon, son of John, are you even my friend? Peter was grieved at the way Jesus asked the question this third time. Lord, you know my heart, you know I am, he said. And Jesus said, then feed my little sheep. So in other, in other translations, it's translated differently. It says, do you love me? But I want you to get the gist of it. Because the way that Jesus asked her, Jesus is asking him, do you really love me? But he answers back, no, I'm your friend. So there's a big, big, big difference in there. So that's a good question. Isn't it a big question? Do you love me? That's a big loaded question when someone asks you, do you love me? You know, it's inter interesting that, that, that I get that question, do you love me? And then Valentine's Day is not too far away, right? <laughs> Valentine's Day is hint, foot stomp guys, all right? You know, when I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you guys out. When I was dating Bernadette, my wife, well, she was my girlfriend at the time, we had a thing called, we had a dating verse. And I want to share that dating verse for you, okay? And it's great in an international standard version. And it goes like this. And I will very glad to spend my money and myself for you. Do you love me less because I love you so much? Boom. That's a good verse. That's the Valentine's verse, right? I'll spend for you even though you don't love me. I love you more, right? That's what we kept saying to each other, that we loved each other, and we quoted scripture. You know, nothing speaks louder about love to the one you love than God's love, right? You can say all you want to say, but if you say it from God's word, that's love. That's true agape love. There's, nothing, there's no preservatives behind that. There's nothing, there's no artificial, there's nothing about that. That is genuine love. So amen to that. So guys, you've been warned, okay? But anyway, it's kind of funny when I was, I was uh, studying this. If you don't get anything for your wife or significant other on Valentine's Day, you're going to have to deal with consequences, right? There's going to be the guilt, there's going to be the shame, and there's going to be rec reconciliation to be, that needs to be done. So you remember, you had one day to do this right, and if you don't get it right, guess what? You're going to have 364 days to make it up, right? Can I hear the lady say amen? amen. All right, that's right. So guys, and for you guys, mean I remind you, there is prayer after the service for your prayer needs and your prayer concerns. All right, back to the sermon. All right, so here we ask, Jesus is asking Peter, three questions that we read. Simon answers, but then what I want to focus on is that when Jesus answers, he gives three slightly different answers. So let's kind of break this down. So the first time he says, after breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others? And then, yes, Peter replied, you know I'm your friend, and feed my lambs, Jesus told him. So the first thing that we want to notice here 
is this is not the response Jesus was looking for, right? Jesus, this is not the response. Jesus is asking for a devotion. Jesus is asking for sacrifice. Instead, the reply is camaraderie and friendship, right? This is, this is totally, a, so literally, Jesus is asking, do you love me more enough that to sacrifice everything? And Peter's reply is, no, you're my friend. You know you're my friend. So Jesus could have easily started by saying, you know, instead of, do you love me? He could have easily started it like, do you remember? Do you remember when you claimed that you would love me to the very end and that you would never fail and leave me? And do you remember that if everyone else fell, fell away and that you're willing to go to prison and die for me? And do you remember you said you'd never deny me? But you did. Jesus easily could have done that. He could have started out, do you remember? And a lot of us, we do that. We do that to ourselves, and we do that to the loved ones. And so, Scripture here shows that Jesus, I mean, Peter denied Jesus later on. But I want to show you that Scripture where Jesus, remember when, when Peter denied Jesus three times? And here's the verse that goes on, the, 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 the climax of that part. And it says in Luke 22, verses 61 and 62, it says, And at that moment, Jesus turned and looked to Jesus. So after the third time, Jesus looked, can you imagine that? After you did something and then you see that person's eye, eye to eye, face to face. Can you imagine that guilt that he all of a sudden just felt? And then he says, then Peter remembered what he had said. And before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times. And Peter walked out of the courtyard crying bitterly. So if there ever was a moment for I told you so moment, that was it. Right? I told you so you were going to deny me. And Peter said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll be with you, and I'll love you to the very end. But that look said it all. I'm sure some of you got that look. And if you don't do anything for Valentine's, you're going to get that look, okay? <laughs> so guilt is such a demotivator. But thank God the opposite is true. Love is a great motivator. So bringing back painful memories in the past wouldn't help Peter. And Jesus, he knew that. He wanted to bring Peter back to the rock status that he was, you know, in a loving and caring manner. So, as we see here also, as we read the verse, it's funny that Jesus, when he is addressing Peter, he's not addressing Peter as what? Peter. He's addressing Peter as what? Simon. Why didn't he say, Peter, do you love me? Instead, he's saying, Simon. So, you know something is wrong when somebody addresses you by your formal name. Right? You ever had somebody address you by your formal name? June, you're going to be in trouble, Villanueva, you know, that, that way. So Jesus is kind of like, he's not pulling any punches anymore. And Jesus is telling Simon, he said, you know, I'm going to address, address you to Simon. And so I wonder if Simon said, okay, he's probably thinking, you shouldn't be addressing me, Peter. But Jesus is saying, since you're going back to your old ways, I'm going to address you by your former self, Simon. So probably Jesus is also wondering, why are you fishing for fish? Remember I told you earlier, you should be fishing for men. And so Jesus, in the past few days, it's understandable. As we recall Peter, the past few days had a, had a, a rough couple of days ago. He was filled with failure, he had frustrations, and I'm sure he was, he was emotionally uh, involved, and he was depressed. And so the last three years, Peter has given his life to Jesus and all the disciples have given their life to Jesus. And there was a time when Jesus died. This is the time for them to take their stand. So instead of taking a stand, what did they do? They took a hike. They went back to fishing. So in this case, when the going gets tough, the tough go fishing. Huh? That, that's, that's the way I'm reading this. That's what the Lord is telling me. So like Simon, many of us, when we fail, what do we do? We go back to something that's comfortable. You like to go back to something that, you, like, that you're, you know you're good at, you feel good at. And so that's what Simon is doing here, and the disciples are doing here. They went back to fishing. And so, the, you know, the, Jesus wants to let you know that he'll take care of Simon. And he was worried about Simon at the time. So that's why he, wanted, he, he engaged Simon out at, at this moment. And he says, all you had to do was ask. I know you're afraid. And you want to go back to your old style and your old fear, but all you had to do is ask. But what was Jesus, uh, uh, Simon's reply? He said, yes, you know that I'm your friend. So Simon replied by friendship instead of sacrificial love. 
So this goes on to say that Simon, realizing what he did in the past, he didn't want to commit anymore. He was afraid to commit. Sometimes when you get burned so bad, when the same thing happens again, now you're kind of, you're tentative, right? You're, you don't want to be hurt that same way again. Just like your, you know, your first love, you, when, you got, when they first, you thought that was the one and they broke up, and then now you're kind of guarded your second time around. Or when you buy a house, and that first house didn't go out right, when you, and it didn't, didn't, didn't go right. So when you buy that second house, now things you're like, okay, now I know I, I, I shouldn't go in full full tilt like I did last time. I know my, by experience what I need to do this time. So you see, Jesus was, um, Simon was being more upfront with Jesus and said, now that I learned before you were crucified what, and what happened, I'm going to be more guarded and give you an answer that it's not what you want, but it's, it's, I'm still your friend. You still got me. I'm still your friend. But Jesus told him, you need to feed my lambs. So the first time the uh, feed my lambs here is translated in Greek, is pastor. And the Greek pastor term means present tense. And it means to, it's a continual process. So don't stop. You need to keep going. Feed my lambs. And the, la- and the description that Jesus is providing for lambs is that lambs, they're immature. They're vulnerable and constantly needing care and caring for. So Jesus wants Simon, in this case, to know that you know, my time here is almost done. My three years, my d is coming up, <laughs> right? It's time for me to PCS. Now it's time for you, Peter, Simon, to become Peter, and you need to step up, right? That's what he's basically telling him. And so, and I like how Jesus does it. Jesus doesn't condemn Simon, but he's trying to do it in a loving way. And you need to do this, Simon, for me, you know, Remember, this, remember that someone that you first loved when you fell in love with somebody? You wanted to know everything about them, their likes, their dislikes, their interests. And how about when you first became a believer? When you first became a believer, you were on fire for the Lord. You wanted to memorize verse. You wanted to go to church, whatever, all church activities. You wanted to do those things. So when Jesus was referring to the lambs, he was talking about those who received Christ for the first time. You remember when you received Christ for the first time? You're going to influence them now. And what you say, they're going to follow. You say jump, they'll say how high, right? These are new believers. So these are the lambs that we're talking about. They can be easily influenced and they can easily be persuaded. Remember like somebody when you have your job and you get your very first job, you want to learn everything about that job so that you can become a productive member of that workforce, right? So anything you say, I mean, anything that person teaches you, you're like soaking this information like a sponge, So that's what Jesus was telling Simon. Take care of the lambs. They're so fragile. They're so precious. But oh, they're so worth it. They're so worth it. You know, they they need you, Peter. This flock, they will need you. They will need you. They will test you. And they'll look for you for guidance. But if you take care of them, believe me, they'll take care of you. That's what Jesus is trying to instill to Peter. You know, we all need each other in this business, in this mission, while we're here on this side of heaven. You know, Jesus' command is, right, love each other as I have loved you. Not be friends with one another. Love one another. Big difference. Big, big difference. So that's the first, do you love me, right? So the second one goes on to say, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you really love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I'm your friend, then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. So here we, basically it's the same thing. There's, uh, Jesus' question and Simon's response is the same thing. But the only main difference is Jesus switches the terms from lambs to sheep. So the difference between lambs and sheep, that lambs, they're actually sheep, but they're less than one year old. So when the, when the lamb becomes over one year, one year old, they officially become sheep, right? I didn't know that, and I was like, ah, oh, things that make you go, mm, right? So lambs are young, they're underdeveloped, and they're weak. But the sheep should be more mature, more developed, more sensible, and more experienced. So in this exchange, Jesus is emphasizing that you need to take care of the sheep in a more supervisory capacity, or more a managerial uh, way. So in management, 
there are two key characteristics in management, responsibility and also authority. So responsibility is accounting for something or someone with power, control, power and control, and authority, the power to determine or otherwise settle issues. So here's Jesus passing the baton. Not only that, but he's also passing on him the responsibility and then the authority. You know, when someone tells you something and you say, you can't do that, they said, what authority do you have? Right? And if you have the AFI or if you have your regs to back you up, you're like, according to AFI so-and-so, you can't do this. And so this is what Jesus is passing on to Peter. He says, you have the, not only the responsibility, but you have the power to do it now. You have the authority to do that. So that is a big thing for Peter. And that probably encouraged Peter. said, okay, now that I have authority. So what I say goes, kind of, right? He said, no, but you do have the authority to do things. And then Peter took that to heart. And we see in his, in his epistle, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, feed the flock. Uh, feed the flock of God, care for it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you'll get out of it, but because you are eager to serve the Lord. So how are we going to feed the flock? Of course, we're going to feed the flock with the Word of God. And he goes on to say in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, you will never be able to eat solid spiritual food and understand the deeper things of God's will, Word until you become better Christians and learn right from wrong by practicing doing right. So now we have to read God's Word, and we got to practice by doing right. You've heard of muscle memory? Muscle memory, right? Muscle memory, so let's say you want to learn a song in piano. If you play that song on the piano over and over again, the assumption is you're going to get better, right? So practice usually makes perfect in muscle memory. To be accurate to do something, you got to do it over and over again. Then your brain kind of tells your muscles, oh, that's, that's how you do it. So it does, does this way. So the opposite can be true. If you do something over and over again the wrong way, you're wasting time doing something, developing a bad habit. That you, Now you've developed this habit, now it's going to be hard for you to break that habit when you try to change things. So here's a good example. Well, I mean, the key to building good memory uh, muscle is like the quality of your practice time. So a good question is, there was a Sunday school teacher. He asked his students... For memory verse. And so the kids gave their memory verse. Of course, they, they recited there was a ton of John 3.16, for God to love the world, la, 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 right? And then Philippians 4.13, and, you know, we can do everything through Christ who strengthened us. But there was one girl who quoted something different. And the girl quoted John 11.35. She said, I have a verse for you, sir. And the, the Sunday school teacher said, okay, go ahead, say your verse. And so she said, Jesus wept. And so the Sunday school teacher said, that is awesome. Thanks for it. And then, and then he said, okay, who has another memory verse? But the girl said, hold on, I'm not done yet. And says, uh, you're, that is, that's right. Jesus wept. It's good. She said, no, no, I'm not done. I practice it. I practice it. Can I finish it? I said, okay, go ahead. Jesus wept, period. <laughs> that's how she did that. That's the way she practiced it. I mean, this girl will make a good lawyer or a theologian, one or the other, right? This girl is smart. She practiced to the point of perfection, even adding the period at the end, and that's what I call practicing doing right, right? That's how you want to do it. If you're going to do it, do it right. Do it right the first time and do it perfectly. So when you go on from there, muscle memory, is out, it takes over. So if you memorize scripture just like that, it takes when you're in problems, when you're in persecutions, when you're in trials, when you're depressed, muscle memory kicks in. There's your verse right there, right? That's what happens. That's what Jesus was telling about when he said, you need to take care of the sheep. So Peter, or Simon in this case, it should be automatic for you to do this. I don't have to tell you to do this. Do you love me? Don't answer me like you're a friend. Ask me like you sacrificially are going to do this for me until the very end. All right? So the third time, he goes on to say the question one more time. And once more, he asked Simon, son of John, are you even my friend? And Peter was grieved at the way Jesus asked the question this third time. Lord, you know my heart. You know I am, he said. And Jesus said, then feed my little sheep. So what do we see here? Peter ha uh, Jesus has to come down to Peter's level. Since Peter can't meet Jesus, he comes down to him. Are you even my friend? Since you don't love me, are you even my friend? 
So what does that mean to us, that we can come to Jesus and Jesus meets us at our, at our level? Jesus can forgive you. Jesus can heal you. Jesus can take that guilt and all that negativity away of your life. Why? Because he has that authority and he has that power to do that. When we try to do things on our own, we fail. And we fail miserably. Just like Peter, epic fail. Epic fail when we try to do things on our own. So don't let the guilt, that heavy feeling take you over because that's when the devil comes in and that's when Satan can get you. He gets you, and we know that, Satan doesn't fight fair. He gets you when you're weakest. You know when you're weakest? You know when you're on a diet and then you open up that fridge and there's some good stuff in there? That hunger gets you at your weakness, doesn't it? If you're not prepared, if you're not planned, if you're not, it's not everything set right, that cheesecake looks real good. It's real good. All right, so... So this third time, literally the translation, feed my little sheep, Jesus is confirming here. You need to do everything, man. For the, you need to not only tend, you need to care, you need to provide. You need to do all this spiritual stuff for your people. You know, from the youngest lamb to the oldest sheep, it's a continual process. You're going to have to keep doing this. You can't stop, Peter. You've got to keep going. So the totality for this is Peter, he's telling him, you need to, you need to shepherd these people all the way through. From the first breath to the last breath. And he was not only talking to Simon. Remember, the disciples were there. So the disciples, he was, even though I'm sure he was talking just to Simon, the others were hearing it at the same time. The word was for everybody at that time. So maybe you're saying, you know, June, I'm no super Christian. And I can only say maybe I don't love the Lord the way you do. And you know what? Jesus is okay with that. Our Lord is okay with that. He'll meet you at that level. Whatever level you're going to give it to him, He's okay with that, and he'll meet you right where you're at and lift you up where you need to be lifted. So I found some awesome takeaways from our scripture from, from today, and one of them is that Jesus forgives and he reigns faithful. That's our God. That's our Jesus. You know, he, he's so devoted to us, even though we're not devoted to him, and we thought Peter, we thought he burned his bridges with Jesus, but no. Jesus wanted to reassure him, and he said, even if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. That's how faithful he is. So you say, Lord, I'm going to do something for you, and you don't do it. It's okay. Come to Jesus. He's always waiting for you. If you need a ride, he's there to give you a ride. Need help with your homework? He'll help you with your homework. Need help with your problems? He's there for you 24-7, right? He's the ad hoc. He's the control center. He's everything. He'll provide for you all your needs. Not only that, Jesus patiently teaches. As you can see in our scripture, he had to do it over and over again with Peter. Peter, I don't know, is he rock because he has a rock head or what? He had to do this over and over again constantly, but P Jesus was patient enough knowing that the master sees what, what's going to happen. You know, the, the student's got to learn, and so he said, I will instruct and teach you in the way you should go. And not only that, but Jesus sees our potential. So the very first time when, when Jesus called Peter, you know, like we said, he was kind of rough around the edges. He was outspoken. He was reckless. But Jesus saw something different in Peter. He saw something, a firm believer and a faithful friend. And so he who began a good work will carry it to completion, right? And then Jesus uses the ordinary. Jesus, uh, Peter was just an ordinary fisherman, but Jesus used him, you know, a lot of us can say, we can't do it. But the great scripture says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they looked, uh, took note that these men had been with Jesus. You can do all things. If you've been with Jesus, if you know Jesus, if you have a relationship with Jesus, he can bring you there. Where you fall short or where you can't go anymore, he kicks in. He takes over. He puts it into turbo overdrive, right? That's the Jesus we know. So Peter's story is tremendously encouraging for all of us because why? We've all failed. You know, we've all failed, but God picks us up. And he knows not only why, because we probably say we, we're not worth it. Sure, God knows the worst in us, but also God knows the best about you. He knows that you're a child of God. He knows you're a new creation. He knows you have the capacity to grow into the likeness of his son. And through the Holy Spirit, you can do all things, you know, period, right? 
So because he knows this, he knows you can rebound from your failures. You have the potential to be stronger and greater than more than you can ask or imagine in his name. So maybe you've turned your back on God or Jesus and, and went back to your old way of life, but that's okay. Listen to that same voice when they were fishing, the disciples, when, when the night they went fishing. They didn't catch anything. So it is a perfect time to come, to come clean and come to Jesus. I can imagine you've you're, if, you, if you've gone fishing, you haven't caught fishing, uh, much fishing on your own terms. Bring it to the, you know, Jesus said, why don't you try the other side? Why don't you try my way? And get ready, because you won't be able to hold what Jesus has in store for you. Jesus is waiting for you. So my question, my conclusion is, do you love Jesus? Because he loves you. Let's pray. Dear Father, we're thankful for today. We thank you for your study of Peter and how he's taught us so many ways. Thank you, Lord, that uh, when you ask us or you asked him that question, do you love me? I pray that our response is yes, Lord. We love you wholeheartedly. We're willing to serve you, Father God. And so I pray for the challenge to your people that they will continue to serve you, Father God, knowing, Lord, that their reward was coming uh, and they're going to look better, they're going to they're be better because knowing, Lord, that you are, we are the winners already for today and for the rest of our lives. So uh, pray for the remainder of today. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you need prayer, there's a prayer team up here for you. Guys, remember, Valentine's, okay? God bless you. <laughs>